So this is the Interledger bi-weekly call. It's Wednesday, November 11th. Thanks for joining. If you're listening on the recording, um, we've, uh, we've got uh, Brandon on the agenda today. Um, he's offered to give us a, um, a lowdown on what he's been doing with Codius. Uh, very exciting to see uh, where that's been progressing. He's been doing a lot of interesting work with open fast and you know, functions as a service. Um, so uh, we'll kick off with that. If there's any time at the end, we'll see if anyone has any other business to discuss. Um, anyone have anything they want to put on to the end of the agenda now before we start? Um, yeah, I had one quick thing. Um, so this is, this is maybe a bit of a general question. Um, I have a question about um, user accounts, ILP accounts that are created only with public keys. Um, so I can go into more detail on that later. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, let's, let's, um, if there's no time, we can pick it up by the forums or, or defer to next week, but that sounds good. Great. Thanks for joining us, Brock. Um, in that case, I'm going to hand over to Brandon. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm going to remember how to share my screen. Okay. Um, can everyone see my screen and hear me? Yep. Great. Um, so this is the Codius dashboard. Um, Codius right now is a serverless functions as a service hosting solution uh, that's powered by OpenFAS and paid for by Interledger. Um, OpenFAS is a uh, long-standing uh, open platform for serverless functions, kind of an alternative to vendor locked in solutions like AWS Lambda. Um, and uh, like Codius has always promised, uh, it OpenFAS supports any programming language. It has a bunch of supported uh, templates for a specific set of languages, but you're also able to bring your own Docker file. Um, a key feature that we have is no account signup in order to deploy to a Codius host. Um, the way that you do deploy is you go to the host GitHub app and you can install it to a GitHub repository that you want to, uh, where you have a function that you want to deploy. So I'm going to add another function here and that should be now installed. And um, so right now, I have, I have three functions deployed um, and I've gone halfway through the steps of how I deployed each of these. Uh, what I need to do is go to the GitHub repository that I just installed that GitHub app on, which is over here, my astronaut counter, counter forked repo. And uh, deploys happen anytime you do a git push to the GitHub repository. Um, so I'm going to do a little change here, add a period, and I don't actually know if that would have auto filled in. And I'm going to commit to master. Um, via the GitHub app, there's an automatic build process where it's going to build the container and deploy this. Um, OpenFAS is running on Kubernetes, so it's going to be a uh, Kubernetes deployment that will, that OpenFAS will automatically scale up and down 
even down to zero instances uh, based on load. And we can go back over here and check my list of functions. And here's our brand new astronaut counter, which was deployed just a few seconds ago. Um, so this function dashboard page gives us a number of, a number of things. A important one that has been another key part of Codius is a tested hosting, meaning this is the Codius host saying the exact uh, code that it is hosting. So you know that when you invoke this function, when you make a request to this, uh, the host is going to serve the exact code that's available at this GitHub repository at this commit hash. Um, and you can go ahead and make a request to it. And how many astronauts are on the International Space Station right now? There are three. Um, so that, that's a pretty basic uh, function experience. If anyone actually wanted, you could right now uh, make a fork of this repository. I'll throw it. Oh, well, it should be easy to pull up. I'm having trouble finding the chat while I'm sharing my screen. Um, you can make a fork of this, as well as head to system.tests.codiusfaz.net slash dashboard. There's a chat. <laughs> I, I think that should include cosmonauts. Um, Yeah, so if anyone wants, you can fork that GitHub repository, go to the Codius host page, click the GitHub app link at the top, and install the app on that particular uh, GitHub repo. Um, it'll give you the option to install it on all of your repos. I wouldn't suggest that. Um, it, it would make this host try to deploy functions on every repository you have every time you did a push on it, most of which are almost assuredly not actual functions. Um, so then I want to show off a more complicated function setup. Um, so I have, I have a couple functions here. They're actually paired together. One of them is a, a Hugo static blog. And the other is a bare bones uh, blog post editor. And I, I, I guess before I get to the specifics of those, I want to highlight the, the payments portion of Codius with OpenFAS. Um, on the dashboard, it shows the number of invocations remaining. This is the number of requests that the host will is willing to serve to this function until uh, it, assuming it gets no more payment. And so how do you actually pay? Um, right now, the, the way to pay is with web monetization. And this dashboard page for this function is web monetized. So I'm going to go and turn on my coil extension and refresh here. And we can watch as we are paying with web monetization and the balance is essentially refilling for this function. Um, I have that there's currently the option of when you deploy a function, you can configure it with your own payment pointer, which can allow the Codius host to, once 
it decides that the function balance is sufficient, it will, whenever payments are made to this function, it, the Codeus host will, instead of paying itself and the function balance, it'll redirect those overflow payments directly to you, to the payment pointer that you've configured. Um, so now to look at this blog example. Um, so here's, here's the actual blog. Uh, it's again, a forked repo. I am not Alex. Alex uh, is a guy who has done a lot of work with the open faz. Um, and it is just keep the, the posts of this blog are, they just exist in the function repo uh, as files. Um, right now, there's not a convenient way to keep state in these functions, uh, which you really need when they are potentially scaring, scaling all the way down to zero instances. Um, you can't really keep state in memory. Uh, so this blog function has a, an interesting take on that in that it's, it's using GitHub, uh, like Git itself to keep state. Um, and so we have our other, our add post function. Uh, we can watch it spin up or have its balance topped up. And um, you can add a add a post, head down here and commit. And what's actually happening, happening with this function is it's been configured with a, uh, what is it? A git, uh, a deploy key uh, for my GitHub account with right access to this repository. And so that add, add blog post function is doing a git commit to this repo and adding a the post that I just made. Um, if it worked, yes, there was a new commit just now. Uh, what happened? It added this post as a file. And so I can go back to the blog, refresh, Refresh again, and we have uh, the post that we just made. Um, so it's a couple of things worth pointing out and how this is possible. Um, so in, in order for that the add post function to use the deploy key, all, all of the configuration is happening here in GitHub which means I need to put that secret key in this public repository. Um, OpenFAS has uh, a tool called Sealed Secrets, which lets you encrypt uh, private data using a public key. There's, a, there's the Codius hosts uh, Sealed Secrets public key and uh, there's a, a sealed secrets CLI uh, tool that you use to um, encrypt and uh, format the secrets. They end up just looking like this. And that allows you to safely uh, 
configure your functions with uh, private data. Um, I think those are the main key features. I guess if, if anyone wants to uh, add a post, um, I think that there is a some basic auth at play, but it's um, those. That's the, the login for it. Uh, but does anyone have any questions or uh, observations about this? I'll start by saying thanks, Brandon. That's awesome. Um, a working demo, yeah. And the demo gods were were certainly on your side. Um, that's pretty. It's pretty complex bunch of interactions, and they all work pretty seamlessly. Um, I would be interested to know uh, where is the web monetization happening in these various. Like you were jumping around between a bunch of screens. I think when you're viewing the dashboard, you're paying the the host, right? So like if you're on this page, you're streaming money to the host. Um, do you? Uh, how would you pay money to like the publishers of a function? How would they earn money? Right. Uh, yeah. So just on the generic dashboard, um, that's going directly to the host to no one's benefit except the host. Uh, when you go, this, this page is also going to just the host, but when you go into a specific functions page, um, it, it's, going to the host as as long as it the host thinks it's worth uh, increasing the balance for this function um, and it, it's crediting the balance of this function for the, the payments it's receiving on this page uh, like I said once it exceeds the threshold I forget what I have it as configured as it will um, this is actually a, a revenue sharing payment pointer. And once the, the function balance is sufficient, it will instead pay the payment pointer that the developer of this function has configured um, in, in the, the function configuration file. So I, cool. I believe that okay. right now it, it's probably paying the payment pointer I have configured in here, which I, I don't actually have one. I, I thought I had, did, but I don't at the moment. Um, okay. Okay. No, no, no. I was just, so I guess the, the use case that I'm interested in is like, if I were to build a function and deploy it and people are using it, how do I get them to pay for the hosting of that function while they use the function? So not necessarily visiting, like when they're on this page. Yeah. Um, so that's that's actually happening with the blog. Um, I have configured the blog function to be web monetized, and it's using that revenue sharing function specific payment pointer that the host uses. Um, so the the payments happening to the blog are have the same rules for on that dashboard page. Okay, cool. And I, who, who, that payment point is generated by the host, right? Yes. And it's, and it, is it exposed uh, to the function somehow through like an environment variable or something? Yes. Um, let me try to see if I can find where I put it. Um, I may have like hard coded it <laughs> in the, in the blog itself. Okay, but but I mean that's the general idea. Like, if you want to host a, you want to write a function that people use, and then you know people are gonna fund the hosting of that function, and then you're gonna earn anything above and beyond that. Like, that's all possible today. You would, you would, um, the the Codius host is gonna have a payment pointer that it generates for you to use, and you just need to in the code of your function. If the function itself renders like a web UI, you need to up put that same payment point in the meta tag. Yes. Yeah, here, here we go. 
there it is. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So so this is generic to the host, and then it's just GitHub username dash function name. Cool. That looks like it's using Sabine's Hugo uh, plugin for web monetization. Is it? It wasn't. I I think it wasn't working with. Uh, Maybe with the, oh, the functionized version. Okay. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the hack way that Sabina also <laughs> okay. pointed out in her blog post. Cool. But yeah, it, it was helpful that she had already dabbled in web monetizing Hugo blogs. Awesome. Uh, any questions for Brandon? Brandon, just a quick one. Um, I might have missed it. Uh, the how does the host know how much money it's earning? Is it got a way to monitor that from the receipts, or is it just using the probabilistic part of the revenue sharing to work out what is overflow and not? Yeah, it's it's using receipts. Um, so on on this page, and I, I guess it's worth pointing out, you would in, in order for uh, this to uh, actually top up the functions balance, uh, this page needs to be submitting receipts to the Codius host receipt verifier. Um, so that is happening on the dashboard page. I, it's probably not happening on the blog at this point. Um, and so it, it'll get that, um, it, the receipt verifier it uses kind of keeps track of, um, uh, which like, okay, this receipt belonged to this stream connection, which it, the verifier stored a corresponding ID, which it'll use as the function balance ID. Um, so it, if, uh, it, the host gets a receipt and it sees that, hey, this was for this function and was paid to me, the host, I'm going to increase the balance. Um, and then in, in terms of deciding when the SPSP query initially happens to that revenue sharing payment pointer, uh, it will, it, it does a query to a, it's actually a revenue sharing function that checks the balance and returns the payment pointer to use based on how high the balance is. Um, and so it, it's at that point where it decides um, proxy this SPSP request to the host uh, payment pointer or to the, the developers. Thanks, that answered my question exactly. Like that's quite cool. So basically you're completely out of the ILP infrastructure as such, um, which is quite a nice property. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Brandon, I guess a follow on for that. Do you feel if you had more raw ILP access, there could be a lot more opportunity here? Or do you think the receipt solves the problem space good enough? I, I'm i sure that it makes more things possible, like possibly even like switching over. Um, so let's say that the balance hits the sufficient threshold during a connection, like you could maybe at that moment even during a, a web, monetization, web monetized session, like start redirecting to the, the user. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't mind not having to get too deep into it. Um, and I've, I've gotten familiar enough with receipts and how to use them. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Awesome, awesome demo and well done. Um, uh, it looks simple, but this is, uh, I know, like months, if not year of, of like culmination of work.
and uh, I mean, lots of moving it's, parts. Yeah, it's also on the shoulders of years of work on the Open Fast project by that team. Um, I just wanted to point out one more thing: the our astronaut counter. We haven't been using it, so it scaled down to zero replicas. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, open open files at the moment, how, like, do they do monetization in some way, or was the idea that you just run it for your own projects and you bring your own Kubernetes cluster? Uh, they they do consulting um, with companies trying to to use this um, for whatever their projects are, but they um, they're not hosting. Uh, yeah, they're offering any kind of hosting solution like that they're operating. You know, um, is there, is there, like, who do I get in contact if I want to run one of these? Uh, if you want to run a, a, a Codeus host like this one, like a, a web monetized open FAS host. Yeah. Uh, you could reach out to me on the, the inner ledger Slack. Um, if you'd like, it's, there's still, this is still a work in progress. Um, a, a, a lot of the components of this are like running on unmerged branches that I have. Um, so that there's a lot of cleaning up to do, but yeah, um, you, you can check with me about uh, looking into setting one of these up. Cool, well, thanks. Awesome, thanks, Brandon. That's that's really that's really impressive, and I, I mean, it's kind of exciting about where it could go now because like you just sort of there's a lot of moving parts you've had to pull together, but now you know it's starting to bear some fruit. You're seeing you know the the the, the dream of the autonomous hosted uh, the autonomous self-funded hosted services and so on is it's not too far away. Um, so what are your what are your plans for kind of next steps? Any anything you you want to add next or um, immediate plans for the project? Um, I, I spent yesterday and in, instead of really preparing for the demo, like uh, doing a bunch of updates based on changes to the receipt verifier. Um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, I, I guess it, I'm, I'm actually at the point of like giving more thought to the use cases, like use cases for coil to use this, um, uh, I guess we like it'd be neat to have, you know, instead of just web monetization, have something like a tip that um, could either be like a tip button either available here or that someone could put on uh, their blog or whatever that's running on this, and and that could go directly toward. Um, so like in a way, like supporting a developer, like I, I've always wished like uh, that we could easily web monetize uh, GitHub repositories. And this is kind of a roundabout way of achieving that. Um, like when, when you're on this page, you, you are paying, you're, you're paying for the, the hosting of, what the developer built. Um, and it, it, it makes me think of like, there's a, a number of tip, existing tip options that are like, buy me a coffee. And it's like, well, that money's not necessarily being spent on a coffee, but like this is buy me function invocations at my hosting provider. And you, you are literally topping up the balance for that thing, for that developer. Um, and so, yeah, I guess being able to yeah, do it, do it as a tip, like tip a hundred function invocations or tip, you know, a, a week or a month of uh, hosting. Um, yeah, I guess kind of a, adjusting payment options. Like the, I, the, the fact that you can deploy stuff that's um, encrypted um, 
and only the host can decrypt it. So you can put secrets in there. There's some really interesting possibilities there. Obviously, if you trust your hosting provider, like you can imagine, I can imagine like this blog post, for example, each, you know, each blog post could itself be encrypted unless like something is paid for. So you could, you know, have people sponsoring to make um, exclusive content available to other people, things like that. Um, have you have you got any specific use cases that you think like are really appropriate for like functions as a service generally, where monetization is, is kind of quite a uh, a novel like element to it? Um, and I, I I do think of I every time the the ILP torrent has come up, <laughs> like the, yeah the idea of putting the the tracker. Uh, node on Codius is always. Uh, I keep thinking about that. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Any any other anyone else um, have any experience with like functions as a service in general, and have use cases they think are particularly like well suited to that um, architecture? I'm kind of so thinking think back into Codius history, like you mentioned, you have to trust the host. Well you could definitely use this for distributed application as well, where, um, you know, each host has like a share of a key or generates a key. Um, so I think that could be quite interesting as well. Actually generating might be a little bit difficult with the current architecture, but at least you could give it like a key share. Mm -hmm. Or um, you could consider something like um, threshold scheme signature. Is that sort of what you're thinking? Yeah, exactly. Great, um, cool. So, so Brandon, in terms of keeping um, keeping up to speed on your progress, uh, you would you recommend Slack? Just get hold of you via Slack, and you know, watch this GitHub repo. Which GitHub repo is most of the work happening in? Uh, it's in a GitHub repo that I need to move to the Codius org GitHub org <laughs> and rename. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, but. Uh, there's Slack. There's a, there's also a Gitter. Um, I, like it might just be Codius. Um, uh, just just another quick question, Brandon. Have you tried? Um, does OpenFast support glitch uh, glitches? Have you tried that yet? Because I know those are like GitHub repos, I think, um, by default. As like an op oh okay, uh, I have it. Um, okay. Maybe I'll try, if I get a time, I'll test that out. Cause that could also be quite cool that like your glitch is already, you could push it to open fast and then you can have a way to like use it. It's already there, right? And then when people re, re, remix it, then they can basically keep going down the tree. Hmm. Okay, cool. Lots of, uh, lots of interesting ideas and things that could flow from this. So, um, yeah, thanks again, Ren. And, and uh, if anyone wants to get involved, follow this, um, just get hold of Brandon on the, on the community Slack. Um, and we'll be looking out for when, when you're ready to put this all into, uh, into GitHub on the, the Codius org. Um, let us know by the Slack, or maybe um, we can announce it on, on a future call when you've managed to put all of that together. Okay, um, Brock, you had a topic you wanted to raise, um, and then uh, we can see if there's any other business. Do you want to do you want to give a overview of the the question you had? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, um, <clears throat> so, yeah, essentially, um, what my organization is looking for is a way to create user um, ILP accounts for users. So essentially. We're using the um, Interledger RS implementation right now, and you can add accounts with private keys. But we were hoping um, to find some kind of way to just add basically receiver accounts so that we could only um, use their public key. Because um, we just want to use ILP for routing, but um, you know, obviously we can't have the user's private keys. 
So I'm just wondering, is there um, anything going on in that space or, or is this maybe an easy um, function implementation in the existing architecture? Hmm. I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I, I might need to ask you a few clarifying questions. Yeah, um, please. So when, uh, I don't know the Rust implementation well. Um, I don't know who on the call does. I think Kincaid and Matt have both looked at it uh, in some detail. Um, so maybe they have a better idea, but are you talking about being able to create accounts where you have only the public key of the underlying settlement account on, on like a blockchain of, of some sort? As right, opposed to yeah. needing the private key of that. Okay, okay. Um, and and the idea being that uh, when you create those accounts, you're only ever gonna send money to them. You're only ever gonna settle outwards. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That. I mean, that doesn't sound to me like a a, a sort of protocol interoperability thing. That sounds like a rust the rust connector kind of implementation specifics um but maybe yeah as i say i don't know the internals of how that connector works but i don't know if anyone else on the call has comments there i remember ben had a tool for that didn't he um i forget what it's called ben always has great naming but um pretty sure ben had a tool for that so we should yeah that's true a javascript one um damn it yeah, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go look it up. Um, is that Mark, Ben Sharapian? Yeah, Ben Sharapian. Yeah. Interesting. I was actually just talking to him, um, and he said there was nothing out there like that. It might, um, interesting. But maybe yeah, he might have. He might mean. He might mean that it just would need a little bit of updating. Um, okay. We might not have interpre interpreted the use case the same way, but um, basically, what he built was a little server, um, which if you sent money to it uh, over ILP, um, you could just put a crypto address um, in the LP address. Um, and then it would, uh, when it reached a certain amount of money and it was enough to actually do a transaction on Ledger, it would just pay out to that crypto address, um, which sounds pretty much what you're looking for. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Do you know the, the name of this repository? Or? Yeah, I got to catch up with Ben to see why he didn't think of it or if he deliberately thought that it wasn't applicable. Um, and so is there a good way to reach you once we figure this out? Um, yeah, I'm on the uh, Interledger Slack. I can also uh, shoot you my email if that's easier. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll go find you in the Interledger Slack. That sounds good. Cool. It's definitely a use case that's come up before, like the idea of, of receive-only accounts and the ability to just settle out not need the connector to have any like the ability to to um yeah to to access the accounts cool well i mean just, just a, does that sort a of point. answer your question bro oh, go for, go ahead King yeah just 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 one clarifying question for this use case is the connector custodying funds on behalf of users and then making kind of the ledger transfers to the users or is the idea that um, the users themselves are operating some kind of node? Yeah, I, th I think the former is true. Okay. Um, essentially, yeah, we want to send XRP um, to this ILP account that's denominated in, in ERC-20. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's it. They're just receiving. And then the, the depositing um, like returning the the ERC twenty for the XRP again is a um, I guess just the other side of it, but I think it would be handled a little bit differently. Hey, this is this is David. <clears throat> I wonder if you could just like omit the private key on the account that you don't want to be settling, because uh, the settlement engine won't if you're only sending money one way it won't settle if you don't hit a threshold. Interesting. So you're saying don't set the private key on, oh, sorry, which account? 
I mean, uh, well, it sounded like you're going to have a connector with a bunch of user accounts, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you don't have the private keys for those user accounts, which means the settlement engine wouldn't be able to make a payment. So in that model, depending on which way you're trying to move money in the ILP layer, it, uh, which is well unclear to me, but it could be the case that you just don't ever trigger settlement for those user accounts. But is, are you actually asking the, the opposite? Are you like trying to get... Um... Well, so yeah, um, I, may, I may be a little fuzzy on the terminologies, forgive me if I don't make sense here, but... Um... Essentially, what we want to do is we want to create an account for a user that only accepts uh, an ERC-20 token as payment. And so if you send, say, XRP to it, um, that will go through to the user's wallet, you know, their public key. Um, and, you know, in, in a ledger, that would basically hold all the funds as a, basically like collateral. So like... If we're talking about pushing in XRP, the the receiver account would hold XRP in, in a ledger and then disperse this ERC-20 token as settlement. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's, it's doing yeah. a conversion, basically, yeah. um, applying a, 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 a conversion. And then when the ERC-20 balance accumulated towards the user account gets high enough to make sense it actually does the transaction on the ethereum blockchain to send the elc20 token is that right right yeah so your user accounts are denominated in this token um i think david we are i, I like like i say i don't know how the settlement engine integration works on the rest connector but i think david's correct that you could just create the accounts and not have a private key um well, you want so the, well, the private key would actually be for the whole the custody account, right? Yeah. yeah, there would. So, if I'm understanding, there would be one private key for the connector operator to send the outgoing settlements, but then you would want a um, Ethereum address statically configured, or uh, not statically configured, but configured for each account, each user account that's on the connector, um, because you would. You would know that in advance. Um, right now, how the Ethereum, the Rust Ethereum settlement engine works is it's, it's designed around two settlement engines kind of peered with one another. So they do some handshake where they each share their public key and there's a challenge and like that, none of that would be necessary for this use case. So I think like that would probably require some changes, um, but I imagine it'd be relatively simple to um, enable passing in that information to the settlement engine to uh, tell it what uh, the Ethereum address for one of the accounts is. Yeah. And then you would just be configuring the, and then on the Rust node, you would just configure the settlement parameters to say like, okay, whenever it hits this threshold, then trigger one of the settlements mm -hmm. on the settlement engine. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does, does anyone know, like, is there anyone I can uh, talk to about this implementation, these implementation details? Cause um, I only know so much off the top of my head and I feel like I could have, um, I probably have some more technical questions that could be answered probably one-on-one. -on -one. It sounds like your questions are specific to the Rust implementation. So maybe um, ping the Rust channel on the Interledger Slack and see if there's anyone there that can help. Um, and everyone who's on the call today that thinks they can help, um, maybe if you guys don't mind, just, um, uh, you know, listen out for, for questions from Brock on that channel. That'd be really helpful. Yeah, that'd be very uh, much appreciated. So there's a couple of a couple of the original developers of that implementation um, haven't been very active the last while, um, but there are people in the community who still sort of know how it works and could, could help. Um, 
otherwise you may you may have to dig in and, and make the changes yourself <laughs> yeah yeah i was actually wondering um if if georgios would be on this call um i've been i've been dying to talk to him because he's the one who wrote the ethereum settlement engine if i'm not mistaken yeah, I think you you are correct, um, but he's yeah I, he hasn't been on a call for a while, unfortunately. Um, okay. But I remember the name of uh, Ben's tool is called Siren, um, and it's basically like a host service. I see I found some um, Java JavaScript connector plugins related to Siren on Ben's GitHub, um, but I didn't find like a way to set up your own instance. So I think that might be the issue, like. Um, a, it would need some updating, and B, Ben would have to do work to document how to actually run your own instance of that. Um, okay. But I would is it, still... is it spelled like S I R E N? Yeah. Um, cool. So I would, I would still follow up with Ben one more time to just see if, if you know, wants to reference Siren, if he has some suggestions on how to set up something similar. Cool. Yeah, I'll check that out. Okay. I hope that was helpful. Um, sorry that we don't have more of the, the Rust maintainers on the call today, um, but I think between the guys and girls on here, you've, you've got a, a good audience who, who may be able to help you out, bro. Um, yeah, I appreciate that very much. Thanks, guys. Any, any other topics anyone wants to cover? Otherwise, we can call it early today. Okay. In that case, uh, next call is going to be 25th of November, uh, same time, same place. Thanks, everybody. I will go out to the community to find us some good content. Got to try and top Savina and uh, Brandon's last few weeks. Uh, so I'll see what I can do. Uh, and we'll chat again on 25th of November. Thanks all for joining. Ciao. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Awesome.